Good morning. Thanks all to coming to our CART lecture series. I'm to point out to everybody that this lecture series is now also supported by the Brain Research Institute, by the Tarjan Center, and by the Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities Research Center, IDDRC. It took me 10 years to be able to say that that quickly. <laughs> I am very happy to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Carissa Cassio. Uh, many of you know her work already. Carissa um, got her bachelor's from Baylor and her PhD from Emory, both in neuroscience. And she did her postdoctoral training um, at uh, UNC with Joe Piven. There she learned some of the, um, uh, the early techniques in brain imaging. Um, she is now a um, assistant professor at Vanderbilt University, and she's been there for over just about 10 years now, my gosh. Um, and she is an expert in, in neuroimaging, generally in autism, but also in sensory processing in particular. In fact, she's one of the first people uh, to start examining the neural basis of sensory processing in autism back at a time when we weren't really thinking of that as one of the uh, core uh, deficits in autism. But, but now, of course, we all have changed our minds about that. Um, so um, she has worked also, I just learned, with both uh, non-human primates as well as with humans, but now is, is um, focusing on tactile perception in humans. Um, and um, uh, so she is in the psychiatry neuroimaging program in Vanderbilt's Department of Psychiatry, and she also holds an appointment in psychology and human development and is affiliated with the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center, um, which you all know about, as well as the Vanderbilt Brain Institute and the Center for Integrative and Cognitive Neuroscience. And I have been happy to work with her um, on the membership committee at IMFAR for quite a few years now. And um, we're just very happy to have you here. So please join me in welcoming Carissa Cassia. All right, <clears throat> is this on? All right, thank you so much, Susan, for the great introduction. I have to confess to probably being the least useful member of the membership committee <laughs> um, of INSAR, um, but I do appreciate the introduction and the invitation. It's wonderful to be here at UCLA. Um, some of the work that um, has most shaped my ideas and trajectory has come out of um, this group, and so it's really a privilege and an honor to, to be speaking with you today about some of the work in my lab. So um, I always, um, as of late, try to start with acknowledging the people who contributed to the work because it inevitably ends up rushing um, at the end without enough time to adequately talk about that. Um, so on the left there is my lab um, at my um, uh, tenure celebration party um, <laughs> a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, on the far right is Elisa Zoltowski and then um, second from the left is Michelle Fela, and they are going to be um, kind of some of their work is going to be some of the um, uh, highlights of what I talk about today. Um, a number of collaborators, both at Vanderbilt and elsewhere, um, and you can see those listed um, on the right. Um, I'm going to start by talking about some work that I did with my um, K01 uh, grant under the mentorship of Paul Yoder um, and uh, Sasha Key, who's our director of um, electrophysiology services at the Kennedy Center, was a, P, a key collaborator there. Um, and then finally, from my time at UNC, um, uh, Grace Baranek and Greg Essek were um, important in some of the pain and uh, tactile texture work I'll talk about in the middle of the talk. Um, and of course, um, our sources of funding um, and the research participants in our families who allow us to poke and prod them and annoy them in every possible way. So um, we could not do what we do without them. So. Um, as Susan mentioned, uh, we're focused on sensory experiences in autism. And some of this focus really comes from um, it, it has its sort of origins, our interest in it, uh, in the descriptions of people with autism themselves about their sensory experiences in life. So you're all familiar with Temple Grandin, um, who describes her sensory problems as um, being aversive, and she's hypersensitive to certain sounds, like school bells, um, sounds like a dentist drill going through my ears. So a really dramatic description of how sensory hypersensitivity um, <clears throat> can be impairing. Um, and, and difficult for a person with autism. Um, Noki Higashida um, is a young man with autism um, from Japan who put out a book recently called um, 
the reason I jump. Um, and his sensory experiences uh, with autism are slightly different. So he describes kind of a positive affective sensory experience um, that sort of when you read the description kind of makes you understand maybe why um, so there are some sensory sort of basis to a lot of repetitive behavior. So he talks about when he's jumping, he can feel all his body parts really well, his bounding legs and clapping hands, and it makes him feel so, so good. Um, so that's kind of a breadth of, um, on the sort of spectrum of negative affect to positive affect, and that's going to be one of the themes that we'll talk about um, <clears throat> during the time today. So as Susan alluded to, there's been kind of a renaissance of interest in sensory features in autism, and I have to point out that this is not necessarily a new concept. So um, Ornitz and Ritvo, some of the sort of very early experimentalists who um, were, and clinicians who were looking um, at individuals with autism really prominently sort of just Describe these sensory features, um, and they, you know, as things do, they they fell out of vogue for a time. Um, but in the the current version of the DSM, they've sort of made a. a Resurgence, because I think a lot of the anecdotal accounts and a lot of the the strong research that's been continuing on this topic has sort of alerted us to the fact that this altered um, sensory experience might be really important. So, studying uh, sensory processing in people is challenging for a couple of reasons, probably a number of reasons, but I'm going to highlight two here. Um, the first is that what we're trying to do is access what is fundamentally an internal neural process. So this is, you know, the kind of stimulus energy comes into the brain, your brain does something with it, and then what we get to see on the outside is a reaction of some type, of some type right? Um, I like to use this example of these sisters who have a YouTube channel where they taste test different foods. Um, and <laughs> they are both tasting the same food. They're tasting a lime, <laughs> um, and it's very sour. Um, but one sister has this very visible reaction, and the other sister has um, a much more sort of internally directed experience. Um, and so what they may be experiencing on a sensory level may be very similar. Um, but the way that they sort of outwardly display it is different. <clears throat> and that just kind of calls attention to the pathway that we have to go through between stimulus and response um, to really understand sensory processing. So we start with a stimulus, um, the brain interprets it as a sensory event, um, there's some perceptual processing and evaluation that happens um, before we get to that reaction. The second challenge, <laughs> second challenge to studying sensory processing in people is that it's really tough sometimes to separate out the, what is a basic sensory issue from what's a more complex emotional or attention issue. So it could be that Santa smells funny, um, or it could be that she doesn't really like his beard, um, or it could be that she misses mom, or it could be that she's, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, hungry, or just there's all sorts of things that could be playing into this visible reaction that we see. And so this kind of leads me to a point that um, I very <laughs> astutely made at some point um, with colleagues over at dinner, that almost everything we experience is partially sensory, but almost nothing is only sensory. Um, so to try to get um, to address these challenges, we take complementary approaches. And I feel like the strongest research tries to combine um, several of these approaches. So. Um, uh, psychophysics is, the, is one of the, the approaches that I use a lot, um, as well as fMRI and EEG. Um, observational measures, um, kind of controlled settings in the laboratory where we observe stimuli and responses. Um, uh, Self-report and caregiver report questionnaires. Um, and you can see sort of along the top, there's all these different sort of dimensions um, where these have different strengths and weaknesses. So um, psychophysics allows us, for example, tight control over sensory stimuli and the environment so we can be more sure that what we're looking at is strictly sensory and doesn't um, have other confounds. Um, but it's terrible on ecological validity. Nobody spends any of their time sitting in a dark room looking at flashes of light um, for 20 minutes. Um, so we try to combine these different approaches to, to get sort of the best of um, all possible worlds when we're looking at this. So um, because this is kind of a complicated thing, um, we kind of go back to the dictionary definition of what sensory is. And I find in this dec definition from Miriam Webster something that's important for the type of sensory processing that we focus on in my lab. Um, so they define sensory as of or related to a specialized function or mechanism, such as sight, hearing, smell, taste, or touch, by which an animal receives and responds to external or internal stimuli. And that or internal part is one of the, the things that we really focus on because we're you're really used to thinking of um, sensory 
events as things that happen outside of the body in the world out there. Um, and that's true for a lot of sensory events, but not all. So we have, um, we can conceptualize sensory systems as extrapersonal, sort of distal um, vision and hearing where the stimulus energy is happening, sort of, you know, could be happening many, many miles away um, from, from the individual. Um, and then sort of more proximal senses, which are really what we focus on more in our lab, not exclusively, but we definitely have a heavy bias towards them. Um, and this includes touch um, and proprioception, vestibular sense, and then interoception, your sort of sense of your, um, uh, sensory signals from your, your visceral organs. Over time, these interact um, and shape each other, and so it's really important to um, understand the breadth of these systems. So why do we think that um, somatic senses are important for autism? Well, they have a lot of developmental relevance, and I'm gonna give you a few examples here. So the sense of touch um, is really critical in our earliest experiences of social reward and bonding. When we first enter the world, a lot of the information that we get from our caregivers comes through um, the somatic senses, especially caregiving touch. Um, and so that, as we all know, um, you know, the developmental trajectory of autism is kind of happening in very early life, and so we're, we're um, missing something if we don't look at that very early sensory experience. Um, for proprioception, this is really important in learning thing, learning about things like personal space, um, the boundary between yourself and the rest of your environment, including other people, um, interpreting other other people's actions. So some of Morella's work, um, looking at mirror neurons and kind of how the brain helps us to map um, what our body is doing to what another person's body is doing. Um, all of that very, very relevant for autism. Um, and then finally, interoception, and this is something that has come to people's attention more recently, um, but has a lot of um, has a lot of relevance for autism in that it's one of the ways that we really interpret the physiological cues that accompany our own emotional reactions. So. <clears throat> um, with that kind of background, I'm going to talk about a few studies from our lab uh, today. We're going to look first at um, neural correlates of tactile hyper and hypo reactivity in people with autism, um, and then look at how the brain responds differently to pleasant and painful tactile stimuli. So we'll actually kind of cover a range, starting with pain um, and going to sort of mildly pleasant stimuli. Um, <clears throat> and then talk a little bit about interoceptive sensation and autism and the role of the insular cortex. <coughs> so, um, these tactile, um, these sort of sensory reactivity patterns that we talk about come in a few different flavors. So there's hyper responsiveness, which is probably the most familiar to people. Um, and that's sort of just an aversive reaction where we want to be avoiding touch. So um, in this example, we've got sort of a um, aversive reaction to touch from a, a sibling or a friend. Um, there's also hypo reactivity. This is where people are not um, making a behavioral response that we might expect to see. Um, so if I touch you on the shoulder, um, do you notice, do you turn around? If your hands are really dirty, does that bother you? Do you want to go and wash them? Or are you content to just go ahead and um, kind of have that tactile experience continue? And so one of the um, theories that's been kind of mounting um, recently, um, a, a kind of a unifying sort of global theory of everything kind of theory um, has been kind of put forth um, that the, for people with autism, the world is just too intense. Um, and in this paper, the authors kind of describe that um, both hypo responsiveness and hyper responsiveness um, may be different behavioral responses to the same phenomenon, overwhelming sensory input. Um, and that may indeed be the case, um, but it hasn't really been empirically demonstrated. In fact, we don't really know kind of where, um, when, and in what direction neural differences are in autism um, that sort of map onto differences in sensory processing. So it could be that things are happening at, the, at a really low level, kind of throughput from the periphery to the cortex. Um, it could be that things are happening at more sort of a middle level of perception and attention. Um, it could be that the way that sensory systems interact with emotion and arousal systems in the brain are where, um, where the differences are. And so some of the work that we're doing is going to try to um, get at some of those distinctions um, to see if we can understand, um, is this really all just one behavior, different behavioral responses to one neurobiological phenomenon, or are there different neurobiological bases for these patterns? Um, so this is the first study that I'm going to talk about is an ERP study. 
um, where we looked at light touch, um, and this is in kids. So I'm going to flip back and forth. This ERP study is in kids, and I'll end with kids, and in the middle will be a bunch of adults. So just to orient you to that. Um, we used light touch um, using a pneumatic stimulator and had sort of a touch condition and a sham condition. Um, and then we gave measures of tactile hypo and hyper responsiveness derived from a couple of um, uh, parent report measures. Um, and I'll, I'll mention that these measures sort of cover um, uh, multiple sensory modalities. And so we sort of made aggregates out of the variables that only dealt with touch. So the behavioral data that I'll show here is, is specific to touch, which isn't necessarily true across all of our studies. Um, and we use a topographic ERP analysis approach. So we started by identifying in the trials where there was a light touch delivered what the sort of processing window was um, for our TD group and our ASD group um, to that light touch. And you can see already that there's sort of a shorter window of processing. Um, this is where the sort of response is significantly greater to the puff um, air puffs than to the sham stimuli. Um, and so you can see that there's overlapping but a smaller window for the ASD group. Then we looked within that overlapping window um, to identify stable microstates. So topographic ERP analysis uses um, uh, kind of data reduction techniques to identify stable microstates um, that are maintained um, for a certain amount of time. Um, and we identified um, a number of microstates there, five. Um, and looked at those that were sort of wholly contained within this overlapping window of touch processing between the two groups. Um, so we're really focused on these two microstates, um, this green one here and the pink one here. Um, this is from about 120 to 220 milliseconds after the touch stimulus, and this is the very next one from about 220 to 370 milliseconds. Um, and that gives you sort of an idea of topographically where those are, so they're kind of generally over the um, the um, central region of the brain where we would expect responses to touch to be. Um, and what we found was that these two microstates were differentially associated with our behavioral variables. So um, for hyperreactivity, those scores um, where we're sort of showing a defensive response to touch, um, that was associated in a positive direction with the earlier microstate. Um, and hyporeactivity was associated in the opposite direction um, with, uh, with brain response in the, the later microstate. <coughs> so um, just to kind of wrap this experiment up. So that's kind of intuitive, right? So it's, uh, you know, we would expect that um, a greater neural response would sort of be associated with tactile hyper-responsiveness, a, a more diminished response with tactile hypo-responsiveness. Um, but it's actually in conflict with this idea presented by the intense world theory that these two behavioral responses are different behavioral responses to the same kind of neural um, event. So, um, to kind of go on to our second study, so um, we're so I'm shifting now to adults. Um, this is data that I collected as a postdoc and has kind of been the gift that keeps on giving uh, in my lab and have several students and postdocs have kind of worked on it and found new things in the data. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of based on the fact that um, you know, we there are different kinds of touch, right? So there are um, there's discriminative touch and sort of the light touch stimuli that I talked about in the last in the last um, uh, experiment could be sort of categorized this way. Um, and though that kind of touch is primarily mediated by a certain class of peripheral fibers, so the A beta fiber group. Um, these are fast conducting myelinated fibers. They project right to somatosensory cortex through a couple of relay stations. Um, and they're really important for things like haptic discrimination. So in the middle of the night, if you're trying to find your eyeglasses on your nightstand um, and you don't have the benefit of vision, um, your haptic, your sense of haptic touch um, is important for that. Um, fine spatial discrimination, such as you might be using for reading Braille, um, that's the kind of touch that this fiber group um, in this pathway in the brain is uh, specialized for. Um, in contrast, unmyelinated fibers, or C-class fibers, um, are really important for broadly what we might think of as affective touch. So they transmit temperature information, they transmit pain. Um, and there's a relatively recently described subclass of these C fibers um, called CT fibers. And these are low threshold mechanoreceptors that are thought to be kind of a specialized system for transmitting emotional touch to the brain. And I'll 
<clears throat> show you some of the evidence for that after I talk about these, um, these next two experiments. But um, it's a pretty fascinating thing. So, um, so we looked at um, affectively relevant touch uh, in a group of adults with autism. So this is now a smaller group of high-functioning adults. Um, and this first study is going to be talking about pain. So this is a thermal pain stimulus delivered to the calf. Um, it's 49 degrees Celsius, which is pretty hot. Um, and it's sustained. So it's a 21-second stimulus. So this is not an easy protocol to ask people to do. Um, and, we, and I have to sort of just reiterate our gratitude to the people who, um, who went through this um, with us. Um, we have learned and are continuing to learn a lot from it. Um, and then we gave them the adult sensory profile. And um, at the time, the sort of um, best measure we could find for repetitive behaviors, um, which was the RBSR, which is not actually normed on kids, but we adapted it for adult reports. So, um, that becomes important later. Um, and based on some previous research, we looked at a triphasic model of the bold response. So here we're moving from ERP into fMRI. Um, and there's been a lot of fMRI work in pain. Um, and what the consensus seems to be is that there's a network of regions. Um, so um, surprisingly, um, primary somatosensory cortex is not reliably among these regions, um, but secondary somatosensory cortex often is. Um, and the insula is a sort of prominent region in this network, as well as the um, dorsal cingulate, um, anterior cingulate, um, and some cerebellar regions, and the thalamus. And so among these regions, what people have observed um, is that if you have a sustained painful stimulus, um, what tends to happen is that there's this, this increase um, in the bold response So um, um, among these regions. And that's kind of sustained as the stimulus um, goes on. Um, and then when the stimulus goes off, there's a little bit of a bump um, and then sort of a, a decrement in the bold response. And so we've kind of characterized this as sort of an early, intermediate, and late phase of the pain response. So early being kind of acute pain, you're you know, in the first 10 seconds of this you know, sustained painful stimulus, um, the intermediate phase where sort of it's continuing and you're coping, <laughs> um, and the late phase where it's off um, and you're sort of um, recovering and maybe doing some appraisal after the, the stimulus. So, and that's how we're conceptualizing this, and that's how we model this in our, um, in our models for the, the imaging. So what we found was actually pretty surprising. So the pain response in autism, um, initially in that early phase, looked very, very similar to what it did in control. So the typically developing group is here on the left, the ASC on the right. You can see that we're seeing regions of that pain matrix. So we have a secondary somatosensory cortex, insula. Um, we've got the ACC, um, some additional regions here. Um, but what's really striking is that as we go to the intermediate and late phases of that response, um, the ASD group response just drops off. All that orange disappears. Um, whereas in the TD group, we see kind of what we expect. We see this sustained response, um, and then it sort of starts to diminish in this late, um, later phase. Um, so this was true across all the regions that we looked at within that matrix. Um, and so this, is, this plot shows a representative region um, within that matrix, which is the insular cortex. Um, and you can see that sort of in that early phase, they're kind of rising up um, in the same way. Um, um, the typically developing group is sort of staying sustained, um, and the autism group is, is diminishing very rapidly. You can also see that there's quite a bit more inter-individual variability in the autism group, which is true of almost anything I've ever measured. <laughs> um, OK. Um, and so then using this sort of adapted version of the RBSR, um, we interrogated um, self-injurious behaviors. Now, this is a pretty high-functioning group of adults. Um, there were not a lot of really um, severe self-injurious behaviors in this group. Um, uh, but there were some mild um, SIB. And we were basically able to binarize them into those who endorse some form of self-injurious behavior, um, which is kind of depicted in blue here. Um, I'm sorry, in red. Um, and then those who just absolutely didn't endorse any self-injurious behavior. Um, and you can see that there's a pretty striking difference. Now, again, caveat, this is a pretty small sample. We started out with just 16 or so people with autism. And this is then dividing them in half. So this is only eight or so people. So this should be taken with a grain of salt for sure. Um, but a pretty striking difference between these two groups of the autism group. Um, so in the, the SIB group, the ones that endorsed any form, um, we see this sort of rapid decrement um, here. And we don't see that in the subgroup that um, 
that did not endorse any self-injurious behavior. So it may be driven um, by people who have some form of self-injury. We're still kind of you know, digging into that and trying to be able to say that in a more definitive way. Um, so that's sort of our study in pain. Um, and we've also kind of had a very similar design looking at um, affective textures. So um, there's kind of a lot of data on texture perception and um, its affective um, kind of norms um, in the typical population, the general population. So this this bar graph here kind of shows you um, the three types of textures that we use in this study. Um, these, they've, these kinds of textures have been studied quite a bit, um, and they tend to be pretty universally rated as mildly unpleasant for this um, one on the left, which is a plastic mesh. It's um, very similar to the um, uh, texture. It's the, basically, it's the um, kind of bag that you might buy onions or oranges in, um, that kind of thing. So if you stroke that across the skin, people almost universally find that fairly unpleasant to varying degrees. Um, a burlap fabric, which is a, pretty much neutral, um, and then um, a very soft, um, fancy Lancome um, <laughs> cosmetics uh, brush, which people tend to universally find pretty pleasant. Um, and you can see from this chart that, that the ratings of pleasantness don't actually differ for our ASD group. So they also find um, the, the pleasant stimulus pleasant and the unpleasant stimulus unpleasant, um, maybe a little bit more so unpleasant. Um, but very, these, these, kind of, these textures are pretty robust um, and even in our autism group, we see the same patterns. Um, we had sort of a similar sustained um, application of these textures while people were in the scanner. Um, and we took a similar kind of temporal approach to looking at the data. Um, so um, this is the TD group first. So you can see the early, um, intermediate, and late. We see kind of this. Um, response in uh, frontal and somatosensory regions, some parietal um, activation there um, that kind of diminishes with time. Um, and uh, so Elisa, who is the, the lead person on this study, did this very helpful thing of taking a lot of data um, and kind of distilling it into these um, visual representations. So these, these time courses that I'm going to show you before are not actually, um, the data didn't actually go into making those, but they're just sort of a visual representation of the, the pattern that we're seeing across time to just kind of help clarify because um, you end up at the end of sort of three textures and three um, time courses with a lot of a lot of brains so um, so this is kind of generally what the pattern looks like we have this kind of early response to this mildly unpleasant texture um, and you can see the differences between this and the um, and the the pain right so there's just not the same kind of network um, but there are sort of regions that we would be expecting to respond um, and in the ASD group um, we see kind of in the insula um, kind of a, um, a comparable um, comparable response and then sort of a kind of diminished response as time goes on. So certainly nothing as dramatic as we saw in the pain, but the same general pattern um, that, um, that over time um, the TD group seems to be sustaining their response to this mildly unpleasant um, response more so than the ASD group. Um, so um, these are sort of so those are single group maps, and these are sort of the group comparisons. So we didn't see any regions that were more active in the ASD group than the TD group, um, but we see these regions that were um, more active in the typically developing group. Um, they're in the visual cortex. We're not exactly sure what that means. Um, <laughs> it could be some difference in kind of like how they're visualizing the stimuli, um, but essentially pretty similar at this sort of global group level, not factoring in time course, um, similar processing between the two groups. So for this burlap neutral texture, um, kind of see um, a similar pattern, but maybe a little bit more sustained. Um, so we have some frontal and again sort of posterior insula um, and it kind of goes off um, after the offset of the stimulus. Um, and for the ASD group we see this kind of different pattern where there's sort of less of a response initially but then there's kind of a delayed response that shows up in the exact same regions um, but just later in time. So um, again uh, when we do the group contrast, no, di no areas were significantly more active for autism than for the typical group. Um, for the typical group, there were sort of um, 
in the early phase um, a difference here um, between the frontal and this right ang angular gyrus. So um, these are kind of evaluative or multi-sensory processing areas. Um, and so their sort of stronger activation in the typical group um, during the early phase might suggest that the typical group is doing a little bit more to interpret an affectively kind of ambiguous stimulus. OK. Um, and then for the pleasant texture, um, this is what the TD group looks like. So in the early, intermediate, and late, again, we're consistently seeing posterior insular cortex and some um, uh, frontal regions as well. Um, and for the ASC group, um, we have nothing that sort of met our threshold. Um, so diminished response to pleasant touch in ASD. Um, and if you look at the group comparisons, that kind of um, bears out in those. Um, kind of we have um, a little bit of the um, sensory cortex and some, some potentially insular cortex there as well. Um, and again, no regions that were more active for autism than controls. So to kind of summarize this texture data, we have this interaction of um, pleasantness by time where we see kind of this faster decay from mildly unpleasant stimuli in autism which mirrors what we saw for the pain, um, a delayed response for this neutral, um, and then a suppressed response to pleasant touch in ASD. Um, and we looked at how this related to scores on the sensory profile. Um, there were kind of, th there, there were not a ton of um, things that really sort of mapped on very well. But one thing that we saw was that the sensory profile has a score called low registration, which is essentially an index of hypo-responsiveness. Um, and to orient you on this graph, um, low scores on low registration um, would suggest sort of like typical or sort of higher level responders. Um, and higher scores would be lower responders. So those, these people on the right are more hypo-responsive. Um, and so um, it, we looked at the posterior insula um, response to the burlap texture um, in the contralateral um, contralateral insula and saw this sort of differential re relationship. These green lines are basically just sort of demarcating the um, kind of the same region on the x-axis, so sort of 25 to 35 um, uh, score. And I think a typical, you know, I think this is probably the sort of typical range, um, or maybe it's maybe one standard deviation above the typical range. But, um, but essentially, we see this opposite pattern, right, where there's more of a response um, in the kind of more hypo-responsive, the small number of hypo-responsive, um, but those who sort of have more typical response in the typical group have lower insular response, um, whereas in the autism group, it's the opposite. Um, and so when we put it all together, the relationship looks kind of like that with a, with a spline. Okay, this is for the affectively neutral texture, and so there may be additional factors that are kind of driving response to the um, uh, more affectively charged textures. So to summarize the touch studies, um, in the ERP study, we saw that hypo and hyper responsiveness to touch in daily life is associated with different ERP microstates, um, reflecting late perception um, and early attention. In the fMRI study, we sort of see intact initial response across pain, the pain network um, that's dampened then as pain continues. We see a similar but less dramatic pattern for mildly unpleasant touch. We see the opposite pattern for affectively neutral touch, so this delayed response. Um, and we see an association there with uh, sensory hyper-responsiveness, and then diminished response to pleasant touch in the autism group. So you probably noticed that the posterior insula was coming up a lot, um, and that's sort of a region that we think might be pretty important for these things. And that's going to bring me back to this sort of social touch system. So to kind of reorient you to this idea. Um, so it used to be that we thought that C fibers were exclusively pain and temperature, and they didn't respond to any sort of touch that wasn't pain and temperature. Um, and really in the last 20 or 30 years, which is like super recent in the world of somatosensory neuroscience, um, uh, th there have been discovered these low threshold mechanoreceptors, these unmyelinated peripheral fibers that do actually respond to light touch. Um, and they do so in a pretty idiosyncratic way. So uh, apologies for the quality of the figure here, um, but it, it will get the point across. So essentially, this is a CT fiber. Um, and this is the velocity of a lateral stroking stimulus across the skin. 
Um, and you can see this kind of really lovely inverted U-shaped curve um, where there's kind of an optimal speed for these fibers um, that's somewhere sort of in the 3 to 10 millisecond per second range, or centimet centimeters per second range, sorry. Um, Psychophysics, so this is sort of pleasantness rating for that, l that lateral stroking touch. So people tend to rate um, stroking touch that's at this speed as being the most pleasant. So if it's really fast, um, it's not quite as pleasant. If it's too slow, it's not quite as pleasant. This sort of 3 to 10 centimeters per second um, speed is what people kind of will rate as the most pleasant experience. Um, and just to sort of draw a contrast, if you look at sort of the response dynamics um, across these speeds of, um, of uh, the A beta fiber, so this is a slowly adapting fiber, one that we would sort of put in the discriminative touch bucket, um, that it has sort of a linear response. So the faster, um, the faster you stroke, the, the more it fires. Um, and so that's kind of further evidence that this is kind of a specialized system for a particular kind of velocity and um, um, I don't have the data here, but the studies have also been on this force and sort of like it's, you know, they're really tuned to this kind of gentle, slow, pleasant feeling touch. Um, and they have a different projection pathway to the somatosensory cortex. In fact, they actually don't go to primary somatosensory cortex. So this was um, a very clever um, way to demonstrate this. Um, with patients that were um, A beta deafferented subjects. So there's a very small number of people in the world who are born without A beta fibers. Um, and these people in their daily life report that they just don't feel touch. Um, and you can imagine that that's going to be um, a pretty debilitating condition in a lot of ways. Um, a group in Sweden had access to two of these folks. Um, and they use this sort of CT targeted touch, this slow stroking touch, um, and actually were able to demonstrate that they could perceive the touch um, and that their brains responded to the touch. Um, and you can see that the, the touch sort of goes directly to uh, the posterior insula. So it actually bypasses um, S1 um, and it, it is um, kind of the projections go um, directly to the posterior insula. And they actually see a deactivation um, in primary somatosensory cortex. Um, so this was really shocking um, to everybody at the time. Um, but it drew a lot of attention to insular cortex, which has get, been getting a lot of attention for lots of reasons. Um, but um, in the context of somatic sensation, there's sort of there's there's double reasons. So this is a um, nice graphic from Bud Craig um, that sort of describes this posterior to anterior axis of the insula. So here is the insula. Um, it's kind of buried, um, kind of deep within the lateral fissure. Um, and there's this really nice sort of progression um, from posterior to anterior. So the posterior part um, is where a lot of somatic sensory information goes. So the CT afferent um, uh, fibers project there, um, interoceptive afferents project there, um, taste actually also projects there. Um, as you progress more anteriorly, um, it starts to go from sensory to more affective. So homeostatic and motor function, um, environmental conditions, hedonic conditions, um, motivational and cognitive um, relevance. And so this anterior part of the insula is probably the one that most of us are more familiar with as being part of the salience network and really important in identifying what is an emotional stimulus, what's an affective or relevant stimulus, and how am I going to interact with the limbic system of the brain to to mount a response to that. So we were really interested in um, looking at this part of the insula, the posterior insular cortex, and, and in the sort of process of learning about this, we started to realize that there's really not, um, at the time there wasn't much on sort of interoception and um, um, as a sensory system in ASD. And so we sort of did a basic study um, to look at uh, interceptive perception in ASD. And then um, the last day I'll tell you about is an imaging study, a DTI study, where we look at the connection between that anteriormost and posteriormost part of the insula. Um, so we know that sort of hyper-responsiveness to environmental stimuli, that, you know, things that are the more in that distal sensory category that I talked about at the beginning, um, is really, uh, you know, despite the fact that it doesn't get quite as much research attention, it's, you know, a little bit harder to quantify. Um, but when we do quantify it, we find that it strongly associates with core clinical symptoms of ASD. And that does kind of make sense, right? Like a lot of the things that we look at behaviorally in autism are things where 
um, there's something that we're expecting them to engage with and they don't. Um, and as we pointed out, sensory input doesn't only come from the external environment, it comes from inside as well. So our hypothesis in this study was that perhaps the, the salience of internal sensory cues are actually stronger for people with autism and they're actually competing. Um, and we, so we're still in the process of answering that question to be totally truthful, but um, our first step in answering it um, was to just look at interoceptive ability um, in general in autism. So. Um, this is back to children now, um, children and teenagers, and uh, um, we use a classic task um, which is basically just asking people to focus on their heartbeats without feeling their pulse um, and try to count their own heartbeats silently. This is a really hard task to do. Um, uh, I should say that the, the people who did most of the work on this study are Kim Schauder and Lisa Mash, who were both um, research assistants in the lab um, and are both now in clinical psych programs. Um, so this uh, this counting task is really difficult. So you know, essentially, you're you're having to sort of block out not only the external world but your own mental. Anyone who sort of you know attempted to, like me, I'm a terrible meditator. Um, <laughs> and you know, for for those of you who have kind of struggled with that, you may be able to relate to how difficult this task is. Um, and so we basically just ask kids to do this. It takes a lot of explaining to them exactly what they're doing, a lot of sort of behavioral monitoring. Um, but we were really careful about sort of only taking data from kids who we felt really understood the task. Um, and then we just compare the heartbeats that they counted over a pulse ox estimate of their heartbeats um, over four time intervals. And this is going to become important. So we do this in a 25 second condition, a 35, a 45, and then a 100 second condition. Um, <clears throat> On average, we didn't really see any differences in their ability, their accuracy um, for um, detecting their heartbeats. So this is so the typically developing group is here in the light gray. The autism group is in the dark gray. Um, these sort of accuracy scores are. Uh, kind of match what you see in the general literature. So people on the whole are not great at this. Um, <laughs> um, and so the, the autism group overall was no better or no worse. Um, they are sort of pretty similar. Um, you can see that it's a little easier to do um, at shorter intervals than it is over longer intervals um, for people with typical development. Um, for people with autism, we actually saw the opposite. Um, so they actually sustained um, their performance at this 100 second um, interval um, where the typically developing group dropped to you know, very, very low levels. Um, so we interpret this as having kind of a better sustained attention for internal cues um, in autism. And we're currently kind of following up on that and looking how robust their sort of ability to do this is to an external distractor and how it relates to um, cognitive and other kinds of um, variables. So um, to kind of call your attention to the, to kind of reorient you to this um, axis of the insula, the anterior posterior axis, and um, the role of the anterior insula in the salience network and kind of the motivation for the last study I'm going to talk about, which is a DTI study of the insula, um, kind of just show you again, sort of like sensory information is coming here in the posterior part of the insula. You know, we assume that it's traveling um, to the anterior part of the insula. And so we're really interested in sort of the connectivity between those two parts of the insula. So as this internal interoceptive or somatic sensory information is coming to the posterior insula, what's happening as it travels to this part of the brain that we know is really important um, for ascribing affective significance. Um, I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with this model of the salience network as a, as a switch. So the anterior insular cortex is the hub of a salience network. Um, this is um, the work of many people, but um, for me, the person I associate most with this is Lucina Udine, um, who described um, the salience network as sort of a, a toggle between um, what we might think of as internally focused attention, which we generally associate with the default mode network, and more externally directed attention um, that is um, the purview of a number of networks, and here's the central executive uh, network as one exemplar of that. Um, so again, in kids, this, these are our younger kids. So this was the first study that I did um, at, when I arrived at Vanderbilt was this kind of DTI study with younger kids um, where we were able to get structural images um, and not do any functional studies with them. Um, and so you'll note that this is kind of younger um, than a lot of our other, our other um, data sets. 
Um, we use seed regions based on validated insular subdivisions, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. And then we use probabilistic tractography to look at the connection between anterior and posterior insula. And we combine this with the tactile defensiveness and discrimination test. So this is um, an observational measure developed by Grace Baranak at USC now. Um, she was at UNC when I was there as a postdoc. Um, so she's your neighbor here, and she's only recently sort of um, arrived in the area. Um, and essentially, we this um, I will talk about this. I'll go ahead and talk about this now, so I can kind of move through this. Um, this is an observational measure that gives us sort of the ability to to get scores for discriminative touch. So this kind of haptic or form perception that I talked about, um, um, and gross somatic localization. So like where on your body you're touched, um, and also affective um, response to touch. So tactile defensiveness. Um, do kids engage with materials or touch experiences in the observation? Um, or sensory seeking um, and interest. And I, I'm going to try to play this. I didn't, um, I didn't give this a try, so I don't know if it's going to work. Um, but I'm going to show this short clip of a little piece of the TDDT um, to kind of show you how we're able to get um, two of these things in sort of one go here. So this is um, a game where the child's job is to find a shape um, in the middle of a bunch of similar shapes. So it's this little wooden peg, um, and it's in a bucket of uh, noodles. And they're sort of you know cylindrical shapes all. Um, and he is uh, trying to find it. Um, and you'll see that sort of as the task goes on, he develops this sort of sensory seeking behavior um, in addition to that. So let's see okay, if this works. The sound isn't really that important. Okay, I'm going to hide it. And you need to find it. Are you ready? Okay, go. Find it. Where is the peg? Find the peg. Where'd it go? You got it. You got it. Can I have it? Give me the peg. It's like, no, <laughs> you can't have it. <laughs> I'm busy with these noodles. <laughs> so this was a, this was a nice, uh, nice measure for us to be able to look at this affective side of touch as well as the discriminative side. Um, we use probabilistic tractography and these intra-insular subdivisions. So Norm Farb at the University of Toronto um, has this really nice subdivision of the insula. So the insula is a really big region, and it's got a lot of um, functional hom um, heterogeneity, as I kind of pointed out with the um, anterior posterior axis. And so Norm has kind of developed these cytoarchitectonically um, validated regions um, that we use as sort of our seed regions for our um, for our uh, tractography. Um, and then we compared that with a thalamocortical. Um, so we looked at the ventral posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus and the primary somatosensory cortex. So what we would be expecting would be that kind of affective touch might be related to this pathway and more discriminative touch might be re related to this thalamocortical um, pathway. Um, and that we might see sort of differences in the connectivity between um, the anterior and posterior insula. Um, so we actually saw um, elevated mean diffusivity in both tracks, the thalamocortical, which is more discriminative touch, and the intra-insular, which is more effective touch um, in people with autism. Um, uh, and that was the only diffusion, diffusion metric where we saw differences. So we didn't see differences in fractional anisotropy or um, um, uh, axial diffusivity, so the, the mean diffusivity was the metric where we really saw sort of group differences there. So um, some somewhat qualified, but some evidence um, for sort of diminished connectivity between those tracks and autism. Um, for discrimination, for tactile discrimination, we didn't really see association with mean diffusivity in either track. Um, and then for tactile defensiveness, we saw this kind of um, uh, association with intra-insular um, uh, mean diffusivity in the TD group, um, but that was not sort of seen in the ASD group. Um, and then for tactile seeking, we saw um, an association with intra-insular um, MD. So the, the more seeking that um, someone displayed, the more sensory seeking behaviors that we saw, um, the more sort of structurally intact um, those, uh, those pathways within the insula were. Um, so to summarize the insular related work, so um, for the heartbeat perception, we saw intact interoceptive accuracy and enhanced attention to interoceptive cues over these extended time intervals where most typically developing people kind of lose their ability to focus on it. Um, and then for DTI, we see tactile seeking is associated with actually increased integrity of structural connection between the posterior and anterior insula. Okay.
So to summarize um, all together, so the ERP work suggests that hyper and hypo responsiveness to touch are linked to different epochs of the neural response um, and in opposite directions that parallel the behavioral patterns um, counter to what might be predicted by a theory like the intense world theory. Um, the fMRI work suggests that affective touch, including pain, kind of shows different temporal processing profiles in ASD, um, and that overall response to pleasant touch is diminished in ASD. Um, the interoception tasks suggest enhanced sustained attention to these internal sensory cues, um, which I like to think of as sort of an interesting potential therapeutic target to sort of draw on this relative strength. So a lot of times, um, you know, we're looking at deficit, and when we find areas of strength, um, that's a really nice place that we could capitalize and sort of, um, you know, potentially be thinking about mindfulness or meditation as a therapeutic approach for individuals with autism. And I know there's some work that's going on um, in that vein now. Um, and then the DTI results suggest um, diminished structural connectivity between the sensory part of the insula and the affective um, or salience part of the insula. Um, uh, and a relationship between tactile seeking behavior and that connectivity. And I will thank you for your attention <laughs> and be happy to take any questions. Questions to start? Um, maybe I can start. Um, you're probably familiar with David Ginty's work at yes. Harvard. Yes. Um, so he's really focused really on the periphery. He is. Um, how do you think that we could integrate um, an understanding of primary sensory um, problems in the periphery mm -hmm. with what we're seeing in the brain? Yeah, definitely a great question. And he's got some amazing work. Um, so I think that there's a couple ways. <laughs> um, so one of the things that um, was not necessarily a surprise, um, but something that we, that we noted was that we saw these differences in our thalamic cortical um, somatosensory pathways in addition to these kind of higher order affective processing. So I think that there's probably multiple levels where things are being affected, um, and there's probably kind of chain reactions going on along the pathway. Um, so I think that kind of being mindful of, I think our next step is going to be kind of looking at more kind of brainstem level um, imaging and trying to sort of find um, um, with the pain stuff, there's brainstem nuclei that are sort of really known to be really important in um, controlling pain and kind of modulating pain. Um, and so we'll probably, for us, kind of look next at that. Um, this CT afferent story is um, a, another potential way for us to kind of start to integrate um, what we're seeing in the central nervous system with what um, people are seeing in the periphery. There is um, a way in humans to record from peripheral afferents, um, but it's tricky. So it's microneurography where you actually sort of have a thin electrode sort of in the skin. Um, and it's it's a little bit uncomfortable, but it's not so bad, Kathy. It's like, <laughs> it's, it sort of just feels like a little, you know, kind of itchy and uncomfortable for, for me, for, you know, for most of us. For someone with autism, it might be much worse. Um, and it also requires you to sit still for long periods of time. So you have to, you know, recording for one peripheral effort at a time. So it's, uh, you know, it's a very laborious um, kind of thing. So um, that hasn't been done in humans with autism yet. But I feel like we could figure out ways to sort of adapt that kind of an approach, we would be able to start to look at um, to look at peripheral physiology as well. Some of the work of Jim Bodfish has kind of started to look at some of this more sort of peripheral stuff in the pain realm. So he has some work in um, uh, people with autism and co-occurring intellectual and developmental disability, where he's kind of taken um, skin. Uh, skin punctures um, and sort of like looked at the cellular sort of physiology there. Um, and so I think we might be able to get some general sort of like sense of differences in morphometry and that kind of stuff, um, differences in, you know, kind of immune, um, you know, types of sequelae. So I think there's ways to get around it, but it takes a lot of creativity to look at the periphery in humans. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where does development <laughs> it's a good it's question. Not, it's not a fair question, just because getting, I think it's a miracle you got 20 people to have 20, you know, 100 seconds of yes. horrible, you know, really hot stuff on them. Yeah, and yeah. What happens, are these things that are constant across? Right. So yeah, I appreciate your question, and I think that's a good one. Um, I think that 
So we are in, I haven't talked about this work um, in this talk, but it, in parallel, we're starting to look at some of these sensory questions in high-risk infants um, and trying to look at the development of um, some of these differences and where these trajectories might be starting to diverge. Um, the somatosensory system in particular is, is the, the earliest system to develop prenatally. So you are getting input to that system much earlier than pretty much anything else. And so that it is really pretty much fully developed um, at birth. Um, and so we have some stuff in the works um, at, to, to try to look at um, sensory responsiveness patterns and how they map onto um, uh, clinical features of autism across development. Um, we so obviously there's limits to how much you can do. <laughs> um, one of the things that we're hoping to do is to um, capitalize on situations where there's already sort of a painful stimulus. So one of the studies we have planned is um, is uh, will be done in conjunction with well baby visits and to sort of um, look at reactions to um, vaccinations and that kind of thing. And we have there's there's some um, we are helping to develop and there are some already developed kind of measures that are specific for infants. Um, so we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the other, I mean, I, that, that is what I was thinking about, but also what about the other end? Can people learn to modify this? Yeah. Older, so that is an interesting question, and I think that the answer to that is yes. So, you know, the sensory systems in the brain are really plastic and really, um, uh, susceptible to experience, and so it's experience-driven. Um, some of the work of Mark Wallace, who's also at Vanderbilt with me, um, has looked at that in the audiovisual realm. Um, he's identified some differences in, again, sort of the temporal. So a lot of this stuff with the sensory stuff in autism seems like it's less about sort of more or less and more about when. <laughs> um, and so he has sort of seen a parallel in the audiovisual system. So he looks at um, audiovisual binding and sort of the, um, t the difference in time of say an, a sight and a sound over which you will sort of experience those at the same, um, as the same event. Um, and what he sees in people with autism is that that binding window is enlarged. And so people are binding things together that ordinarily wouldn't be. Um, and he has some really nice work doing some perceptual training um, to narrow those binding windows, which seems to have some effectiveness. So, so yeah, I'm hopeful that there's plasticity there. <laughs> yeah, really. Fantastic work. Um, Thank you. As I'm sure you know, there are several people um, that are now interested in looking at how sensory or hyper or hyposensitivity may be related to the development of some social um, deficit that are more characteristic. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you got, um, I, I'm assuming everybody's got at least data severity scores in their studies or SRS or something. Mm -hmm. Did you try and, and see whether any of your um, brain-based measure, whether the ERPs or the MRIs, have related to some indices of social functioning? Right, so we so we have looked at that, um, and I didn't I, I didn't show much of that. Um, sometimes we see it, and sometimes we don't. Um, to be honest, so we didn't really see it with the ERPs. Um, we have seen it with, and we didn't see it with pain. We've seen it with some of the other kind of more um, mildly affective um, tactile stimuli. So it's I my sense is that it's. It's such a leap from sort of brain sensory systems to the social behavior that we're observing that the, the kind of in-between things are where we're more likely to see it. Um, and I think we do see a lot of, um, a lot of concordance between, so the TDDT, for example, so a lot of those variables for tactile responses and stuff map really well onto um, ADOS severity or other kind of more clinical metrics. sensory motor and that sort of motor output. <clears throat> if these early infants that you're looking at, if some of the measures that you're trying to predict sort of sensory measures in early infancy, if you're looking at anything motor related as well, mm -hmm. so what that early motor development might look like in relationship to. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're not actively looking at it, and we probably should be. <laughs> um, so I do, there's other labs who are studying um, babies that we know pretty well that are that we've talked to actually pretty recently, like Dana Iverson and um, Matt Moscone, who um, you know are kind of 
focused on the sort of motor aspect. Um, and so I think as we, the, the baby work is early, and so we probably still have time to add that in. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. That was a great talk, thank you. Um, and yeah, Kathy asked a question I really want to ask about early development, so I'm so happy you're studying babies because <laughs> you know, we, as you know, here study babies very early on. I yeah. do agree that I think that if we can start, which we're already doing imaging too, but just start really understanding these early, early, early mm -hmm. um, kind of underpinnings of these sensory, either hyper or hypo responsiveness, I think we've learned a lot about kind of how that impacts later development. Um, I was curious about, I have another kind of related question actually Marilla kind of asked, which is, I'm really glad that the sensory piece was added to the SM5 because we see it clinically a lot, mm -hmm. as you do in kids with autism. I'm curious to know, how specific do you think sensory deficits or impairments are to autism? Um, and I know that in your studies, you com your comparison group is often TV, mm -hmm. which makes sense, especially for some of the imaging studies, but I'm curious to know if you've thought about looking at other populations in comparison, so, you know, intellectual disability, right. or even, you know, syndromes where, you know, there may be social deficits, but autism is really not their yeah. um, primary neurodevelopmental disorder. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great point, and I, do, I don't think that sensory deficits are specific to autism for sure. We see it, um, I, we see it in a lot of different groups, and I think you know the groups you mentioned, um, also sort of like a lot of the sort of co-occurring ADHD and anxiety that we see in autism. There's a nice body of work, um, kind of looking at the relationships between anxiety and sensory hyperresponsiveness. I think Shula has some of that. Um, that work in her portfolio. So, um, so yeah, I think that these are broad, um, broad cascading effects that sort of do have downstream effects on behavior, but they're not just only the behaviors that are relevant for autism. Yeah. Okay, thank you once again very Thank much. you. Great time.